Okay, hello and welcome. My name is Marsha Mott and I'm the coordinator for the University of Florida Health Wellness University. We have a great presentation today on a topic that affects millions of Americans. We want this um, webinar today to be very interactive and we're gonna allow you to ask questions and answers towards the end of our presentation. Um, if you have a question, you can go ahead and type that anytime you have your question at the bottom of your screen, you'll see a little um, section called Q&A and um, you can type your question there and then we will um, process through those questions and towards the very end of the uh, talk we'll go ahead and ask those questions anonymously. Um, we also have a great, two great speakers that are going to speak today. Our first uh, panelist is Lisa Spiegel. She's a surgical oncologist at the UF Health. She focuses on the surgical care of breast cancer, benign breast disease, and the assessment of high-risk breast cancer patients. Our second speaker that we'll have today is Dr. Mark Leingold. He is a panelist and reconstructive surgeon at UF Health. His clinical interests include microvascular breast reconstruction, general reconstruction, and cosmetic surgery. As you may know, UF Health was recently ranked as the number 33rd cancer program in the nation by US News and World Report. We're very fortunate to have these two amazing positions excuse me, physicians providing excellent health care for people of our, our area. <clears throat> Dr. Um, Spiegel, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you now, okay? Thank you. Great. Thank you, Marcia. I'm going to share my screen. Just going to confirm that you can see that. Marcia, can you see my screen? Yeah, we see it. Wonderful, okay. Um, as Marcia mentioned, I am Dr. Lisa Spiegel. I am the clinical lead of the UF Health Breast Center and I'm here with Dr. Mark Langold, who is the lead breast reconstructive surgeon here at UF Health. We are going to talk to you today on breast cancer and really a focus on what we call an oncoplastic surgical approach. Hmm. Let's see here, it's not advancing, hold on one second. Okay, here we go. So our objectives of our talk today um, are to introduce and to learn about breast cancer, incidence, risk factors, screening and treatment, to describe the surgical options for breast cancer treatment, and to really focus on what we would call oncoplastic options to improve the outcomes in our breast cancer patients. Why is this important? Well, as Marcia mentioned, there are millions of Americans with breast cancer. Breast cancer continues to remain the leading cancer affecting women in the United States. And in 2020, it's estimated to affect up to 280,000 women. In the state of Florida, we'll see about 20,000 breast cancer cases. And over the years, as incidence continues to incline, um, what's important is that mortality continues to decrease. And when women come to see me with a breast cancer diagnosis, 90% of them will be alive in five years. And that is through early detection, advances in our medical therapies, and really our patient education and outreach. What is breast cancer? Well, cancer in general is just abnormal cell growth. In the breast, it typically occurs in the lobules as well as in the ducts. And what's happening, if you can look at this diagram here, is that the cells that normally line these structures are just starting to grow. They start to grow, they start to look abnormal, they start to fill the structure, and eventually they break outside of the structure. How is it detected? Well, we hope that it's detected on mammography. And the general population typically undergoes breast mammography at the age of 40 annually. And this is really how we want to detect, detect cancer. When we look at mammograms, and these are some images of them, we see changes. We see distortion of tissue. We see mass with distortion of tissue. And sometimes we just see little calcifications in the tissue. And this is early. This is early before a patient feels it on self breast exam. This is be typically before even a physician can feel it on a clinical breast exam. And if we find these cancers early, we find them at earlier stages and they're easier um, to treat and get better outcomes. All women have different risk for breast cancer. 
the number one and number two risks are really being a woman and getting older. And the reason is, is because the majority of breast cancers are hormonally driven. The estrogens and the progesterones in our body affect the breast tissue and lead to those changes in the lining of the ducts and the lobules. It's important when I see a patient, not only to talk about risk in general, but to focus on things that we can and can't change or we can and can't make our risk lower. The things we can't change are what I would refer to as non-modifiable. And these really are, again, being a woman, getting older and having more hormones in the body. So the earlier we menstruate, the later we go through menopause. If we never have children, we never stop those menstrual cycles. Things like radiation exposure, dense breast tissue, history of biopsy or atypical biopsy, and we'll talk a little bit more about family history. But things we can change and things you can think about even now are one, understanding your risk, and then also understanding, is it worth it to do hormone replacement therapy after menopause. Hormones can drive breast cancer um, formation. The other things are body weight. After we go through menopause, our hormones, our estrogens, come more from the fatty tissues in our body than our ovaries. And so being overweight or having an unhealthy diet or not being active can increase risk for breast cancer, especially if you're, if you're out of men or in menopause. Alcohol intake can increase risk for breast cancer. So I typically counsel my patients to drink less than four drinks a week of alcohol. The more we drink, the more our risk is for getting breast cancer. And the last one here says lack of screening. And although that is not an independent risk for breast cancer, it does mean that we find breast cancer at later stages, more advanced, more lymph node spread, and so we want women to undergo screening so that we can find those cancers early and more curable. It's important to understand your family history. Family history has a huge impact on risk for breast cancer. Having a first degree relative with breast cancer places a woman at a twofold increased risk for breast cancer in their lifetime. Some women have even stronger family histories where we worry that maybe there is an actual inherited genetic alteration that increases risk for breast cancer. And, and this can be on either the mother's side or the father's side. Sometimes women say, come to see me and say, well, that was on my father's side, so it doesn't affect me. But it does. It can come from the mother or the father. And we see other cancers other than just breast cancer. Cancers such as ovarian cancer, pancreas cancer, prostate, melanoma, thyroid, colon. These other cancers also link up with breast cancer and can lead and can give us information about a woman's lifetime risk and whether they're a candidate for genetic testing. We used to only test the two most common genes, and those two genes were the BRCA1 and 2, which are listed right here. The BRCA1 or breast cancer associated 1 and breast cancer associated 2 genes. These genes continue to remain the cause of 80% of hereditary breast cancers, but we've learned so much more in the last five to 10 years. We look at a whole gene panel of tests and these are various genetic mutations that have various risks of breast cancer. The biggest ones again are the, those BRCA1 and 2, but ATM, CHECK2, PALB2, NBN, P10, TP53, all these mutations have an increased risk for breast cancer. And this is important because it affects not only screening, but sometimes it affects a woman's choice to be more, I guess, proactive in terms of reducing their risk for breast cancer. If a woman has a strong family history, but has negative genetic testing, there are still ways that we can quantitate that woman's risk because even though the genetic testing is negative, there is still something in that family that is leading to increased risk of cancers. And so us as clinicians, when we counsel our patients, we can use what are called risk calculators. There are various risk calculators. The National Cancer Institute has a risk tool called um, Gale Risk. 
there's the Tyra Cusack, there's BRCA Pro. Personally, I use a program called CRA Health for all of my breast cancer patients or even my patients that come to see me with benign breast disease to again, quantitate their risk of getting breast cancer. Everybody's risk is different. And so th these tools allow us to bring in not only family history, but it allows us to bring in their age when they went through um, menarche, when they went through menopause, how many babies they've had, have they ever had a biopsy? Has it been abnormal? And we can put all these factors in and help quantitate a woman's risk so that they understand whether they're at that average risk, which is around 12 and a half percent, or are they higher? And again, this affects the screening recommendations. Mammography remains the gold standard for screening of breast cancer. These are x-ray beams that look at the breast tissue and looking at data shows us that mammography is the only study that has been shown to reduce mortality from breast cancer. It detects cancer smaller with less likely to have lymph node involvement. At UF Health, we follow the American College of Radiology guidelines, which are for a woman with average risk, again, not a woman with a strong family history, but a woman with average risk, we start screening with annual mam mammograms at age 40. Over the past few years, there has been some debate about this in terms of whether we should start later or maybe we should be doing every other year. And that is through the American Cancer Society as well as the US Preventative Task Force. But we again follow the American College of Radiology guidelines, which is um, annual mammograms starting at 40 for the woman of average risk in the general population. Women that are higher risk get screened differently. We not only do annual mammograms, but we add in annual breast MRI and we alternate the imaging studies at six months. So a woman, if she were due for her mammogram in December is then due for her MRI in June and then back to her mammogram in December. So we watch those breasts closer. Women that are candidate for high risk surveillance are women that we know they have a genetic mutation or alteration in their genome that increases their risk for breast cancer, such as BRCA1 and 2 carriers. Patients or women that are relatives of other women that have a genetic link that don't maybe don't want to get tested. So if your sister had breast cancer and was tested for a BRCA1 mutation, and you really just don't want to undergo genetic testing, then we would screen you as if you were positive and do high risk surveillance. Women that are over 20% lifetime risk based on those risk models I showed you. And then women that have had chest wall radiation, um, typically for other cancers such as lymphoma. This is a picture of a screening mammogram. When we do mammograms, we compress the breast side to side and we compress the breast up and down and we're able to look at different areas of the breast to determine where the problem is. Is it in the upper breast? Is it in the lower breast? Is it in the inner breast or outer breast? And again, as I told you, breast density does play a role in increasing risk for breast cancer. All breasts are different, and some of them are what we say more fatty replace, which is actually much easier to see breast cancer formation and lower risk for breast cancer all the way to extremely dense breasts, where it's more difficult to find breast cancers and higher risk of getting breast cancer. So it's important to understand the density of your breast as well. When women get screening mammograms and we find problems or changes, we then add diagnostic imaging. And that's when we call a patient back and we say, we need more mammogram views or what we call magnification views. We compress the breast a little bit more and we can see suspicious calcifications or asymmetry in the breast. We add ultrasound to the breast to see, to use sound waves to look at more densities or masses. And we can use breast MRI to look for cancer. Now, using these modalities 
is a means of also biopsying the breast tissue. And in this day and age, we do not use surgery to diagnose breast cancer. We should have a diagnosis before an operation. We should have a treatment plan before an operation. And we can use all of these modalities to biopsy the suspicious area. Women that we can only find the lesion on mammograms, we do what's called a stereotactic biopsy, which is using the mammogram for biopsy. Women where we can see the lesion on ultrasound, we use an ultrasound to biopsy the lesion. And women where we only see an abnormality on MRI, we use the MRI to detect the problem. We should have a diagnosis before surgery. In a minority of patients, we can't safely biopsy without an operation, and those patients sometimes need a surgery to get a diagnosis. But I'd say in over 90% of women, we can get a diagnosis before an operation. And this is important because we want to get a diagnosis, and we want to stage, and we want to develop a treatment plan. Once we get a cancer diagnosis, we want to know how much disease is in the breast, how much disease is in the lymph nodes, and that's called staging. How big is the tumor? Is the tumor in multiple areas of the breast? Has the tumor spread to the lymph node? And are we worried maybe that the tumor has spread throughout the body? That's how we stage breast cancer. Not only do we stage breast cancer based on where it is in the body, we also stage based on the biology. We look at hormones. Is a woman's cancer driven by estrogen? Is it driven by progesterone? Is it driven by a protein called HER2 nu that causes cells to divide? Years ago, we treated all cancers the same. We treated every woman with the same operation and treated every woman with chemotherapy and we over-treated women. Not all breast cancer is the same and not everybody's story is the same or journey is the same. Biology is important in knowing what each individual breast cancer patient needs, mainly in terms of medicines. When a woman gets a diagnosis of breast cancer, the majority of the time, again, it's hormonally driven. We see estrogen and progesterone proteins on the cancer. Some women have an upregulation of a protein that causes cells to divide. That's called HER2 new amplification. And some women have lack of estrogen, lack of progesterone, and a lack of HER2, and we call that triple negative. One, two, three, triple negative cancers. And this is really important in developing that treatment plan for breast cancer. Treatment and curing breast cancer is a team. It's not just a surgery. We need to treat the breast and we need to treat the body. Some patients ask me, well, if I do a more radical approach to an operation, if I choose mastectomy, do I need chemotherapy? Well, sometimes yes. So we need to understand that treatment and curing breast cancer is a team and it's important to focus on what we do with the breast and what we do with the body. And this talk is specifically geared to what we do with the breast. Surgeons, oncologic surgeons such as myself, take care of the cancer. And our goal is to get that cancer out with clear edges and to sample lymph nodes. The radiation doctor is involved in treatment of the breast and the lymph nodes. And sometimes we add radiation to patients and the reconstructive surgeon is important. Treatment of the body is based on that biology. Is it the tumor hormonally driven? And if it is, we give anti-estrogen therapy, pills that women take for anywhere between five and 10 years. We give chemotherapy, which is medicine through the vein to some women. And we used to give it to all women with a one centimeter tumor, and we don't do that anymore. Some women don't need chemotherapy. And some women need therapy that specifically targets that HER2 new protein. So everybody's treatment plan is different. And at UF Health and anywhere breast cancer treatment is given, it needs to be that team approach that personalizes care with the patient in the center. Every Monday we come together, the surgical oncologist, myself, the plastic surgeon, the medical oncologist, the radiation oncologist, the genetic counselor, the physical therapist, the radiologist, the pathologist. We come together and we discuss every single patient that's diagnosed with cancer at UF Health at a conference. And we make sure we have a unified team approach to their treatment. 
Again, this talk is specifically geared to the surgery, and we'll talk about that. The surgical approach historically had been radical, and that was what it was called. It was called a radical mastectomy. This is Dr. William Halstead from Johns Hopkins, who really was a leader in the United States in terms of breast cancer surgery. And the older thought process was that we needed to take the location where the cancer came from. We needed to take the areas around the cancer, such as the muscle and the lymph nodes to be able to make women or help women survive the disease. And we did what was called a radical mastectomy. But over the years, there have been physicians that have challenged this. In the lower left-hand corner is Bernie Fisher, and he really pioneered studies in the, in the universe, uh, sorry, in the United States, looking at, do we really need to do such aggressive surgery to get the same cancer outcomes? And over the years, we have realized we do not and so we have moved away from radical surgeries to even breast saving surgeries, which you can see in the lower bottom, taking the tumor out with a rim of normal tissue, what we call partial mastectomy, which is a portion of the breast or a lumpectomy. And we have seen in large studies with randomized women that whether we did a radical mastectomy or we just did a simple mastectomy with or without removal of the lymph nodes and saving the muscle, there was no difference in survival when you compare stage to stage. And when you look at total mastectomy compared to breast conservation surgery, there was no difference in survival. And so women have options. We can save the breast. We can save even the skin of the breast and maybe remove the nipple and areola, which is a skin sparing mastectomy. Sometimes we can save all of the skin in a nipple sparing mastectomy, which I'll show an image of. And sometimes we need to remove the majority of the breast tissue and skin in locally advanced cancers. And we use the extent of disease, the tumor location, the size of the breast, whether they have genetic predisposition to cancer and overall it, cosmetic outcomes being very important in the decision-making for our treatment plans. We try to save the breast when we can, because again, there is no difference in breast cancer survival. Whether we save the breast or we remove the breast, you will have the same survival from the breast cancer. But there are some women that need a mastectomy, and those are women that have disease throughout the breast. We say multicentric disease. If there's disease in many different quadrants of the breast, then we need to remove the breast. We can't just take in different areas of the breast. If women have locally advanced cancers, we need to remove the breast. But there are ways where there are sometimes patients that we have multiple areas in the same region or what we would call multifocal. This is a patient that had two cancers about five or six centimeters apart, but it was in the upper quadrant of the breast, not in different areas of the breast in the same region. We call that multifocal disease. We have sometimes tumors in the second picture in inconvenient areas of the breast, in the lower pole of the breast that can affect cosmetic outcomes down the line. Sometimes we have patients where we just need a mastectomy. And so we have surgical techniques to improve the outcomes, the cosmetic outcomes, and ultimately the quality of life of these patients. The two are oncoplastic approach, which we'll talk about, and nipple sparing techniques. An oncoplastic approach really integrates the cancer resection with the reconstruction. And this is a, with a goal to maintain the shape and form of the breast. And we use techniques in conjunction with our reconstructive surgeons, Dr. Langold, use techniques to lift or reduce the breast size so that we can take larger volumes of tissue out and still maintain the shape and form of the breast and don't lead to a deformed breast down the line. This extends our candidacy for breast conservation with again, patients that have disease in the same quadrant of the breast for maybe a larger tumor, but a larger breast so we can take more tissue out or in difficult locations such as the lower pole of the breast. This is that patient. This is her before and after surgery. Nipple sparing techniques 
allow me to save the entire skin envelope of the breast. I can make incisions in the lower side of the breast. I can make incisions away from the nipple of the breast, all different areas on the actual skin of the breast and take the breast tissue off from the skin and off the muscle through a single incision, saving all of the skin. And again, this helps us maintain the aesthetic integrity of the breast and allows for that best cosmetic result down the line. This is a patient that had an upper inner tumor. She chose to have a mastectomy. We did a nipple sparing mastectomy and this is her pre and post operative pictures. So when we think about each cancer patient, we wanna think about that patient as a team. We wanna work close together with our team, whether it's the oncologist and the radiation oncologist, but also with the plastic surgeons to not only provide that ultimate cancer care, but to ultimately provide the best aesthetic outcomes down the line. And so Dr. Langold is gonna start now. I'm gonna end my presentation and he will talk about the reconstructive options and the thought process that he uses to determine candidacy for reconstruction. And I'm going to stop my um, presentation and let him share his. Is it allowing you to share, Mark? Uh, yes. Okay. Can you guys see my screen? We can. Hello. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Mark Langold. Uh, I'm a plastic and reconstructive surgeon at UF Health. Uh, I would like to thank uh, UF Health for the opportunity uh, and uh, to allow me to present on this topic that's very dear to my heart. <clears throat> uh, today we'll be discussing breast reconstruction. I have no disclosures. So first of all, you know, the, the question is why do we perform breast reconstruction? Uh, in my practice, I always want to make sure that patients understand that uh, the cancer, the treatment of breast cancer comes first. Uh, you know, if patients need chemotherapy or radiation or they have very advanced tumor, that's, uh, need, that needs to be addressed um, prior to considering breast reconstruction uh, because that's a uh, life and death, so to speak, situation. Um, however, for most patients, um, reconstruction represents the end of treatment, so to speak, the end of their journey. Uh, a lot of patients after mastectomy um, feel like they lost their femininity, they don't feel whole, um, they uh, feel disfigured. Uh, so in, in, my, uh, in my view, um, when we perform successful breast reconstruction, patients uh, feel like they can get back to normal, they can move on with their life, they feel feminine, uh, they feel whole again. And that's very, very important, uh, both from physical and psychological standpoint. So the uh, goal um, in, uh, in breast reconstruction is to restore one or both breasts and achieve normal shape, appearance, symmetry, and size following mastectomy, lumpectomy, and congenital deformities. So we strive to achieve as normal of a shape, um, as normal of a symmetry as possible, given uh, the current available techniques. So how breast reconstructed? It's important to note uh, that breast reconstruction is a journey. A lot of patients come in, they want something quick and easy. Unfortunately, that's not always the case. Most of the time, uh, there's multiple, there are multiple stages that are involved. Uh, and we generally do it in stages. I generally like to separate the stages of breast reconstruction at least three months apart. And that allows patients to 
uh, recover from surgery, um, recover both physically and, and mentally, and um, kind of tackle the next, the next stage. Um, reconstruction can be done at the time of mastectomy, uh, also known as immediate reconstruction, or it can be delayed until later date. Um, and that's called delayed reconstruction. So how do we reconstruct the breasts? Uh, breast reconstruction generally falls into two categories, although it's a little more complicated than that. Uh, essentially, it can be divided into implant-based reconstruction, also known as prosthetic reconstruction. Um, that, uh, that's, where the, uh, that's where the reconstruction relies on the breast implant to give uh, the form and the shape of a new breast mound. And that's essentially the only thing that, again, shapes the breast. Uh, with uh, flap reconstruction, also known as autologous reconstruction, we use patients on tissue from another part of the body to form a breast. So uh, how do we know which, which option is best? Well, there are multiple factors to consider, such as type of mastectomy, whether it's skin sparing, nipple sparing, um, uh, cancer treatments are, you know, do you need radiation? Are you gonna have chemotherapy? Uh, so they can affect uh, the type of reconstruction we choose. Patient's body time, uh, type is important as well. Uh, and of course, patient's preference um, and also medical comorbidities, health status and history of uh, prior surgeries and specifically surgeries over the abdomen, on the abdomen or breast. So what about symmetry? So um, a lot of times um, to achieve symmetry, uh, especially in a patient that's undergoing um, uh, a unilateral mastect mastectomy, meaning the, the only one breast is removed, we have to do either a lift, a reduction of breast augmentation uh, on the normal breast. Um, and that's usually done uh, not immediately, but at the second or third stage of reconstruction. Uh, as I tell patients, if you have one good looking breast um, and the other breast doesn't match it, it's not a, in my opinion, it's not a, a good reconstructive outcome. So who is a candidate for reconstruction? Um, ideally, um, a good candidate for breast reconstruction should be able to cope well with the diagnosis and treatment. Um, they don't have uh, major medical uh, conditions or illnesses that may impair healing. And a lot of times, if that's the case, we ask patients to, um, you know, start uh, getting healthier and consider uh, performing breast reconstruction when, once those issues are addressed. Um, and it's important to have a positive outlook uh, on, on this journey and have realistic expectations. Uh, so a uh, few things that are important to consider and uh, that, you know, at the end of your treatment, uh, a reconstructed breast will not necessarily have the same sensation or feel as your natural breast. Uh, there is some experimental trials with uh, re-innervating reconstructed breast. Uh, currently, however, even, even with those, um, you know, I don't feel like the sensation is the same. So that's important to, to know. Uh, also visible scars will be present uh, on the breast, uh, whether from reconstruction or mastectomy and certain surgical techniques will leave scars um, at the donor side, such as the abdomen uh, or the thighs or the buttock. And that's also important to, to consider when choosing an option. So cost, the question is who pays for this? A lot of times um, um, my patients ask me, does, am I gonna have to pay out of pocket? How much does this cost? Well, the good news is that in 1998, there was a Women's Health and Cancer Right Acts, Rights Act, sorry, that was a, essentially a federal law that was passed that requires all health insurance plans to cover uh, breast reconstruction as part of breast cancer treatment. Whether it's, um, you know, first stage, such as placing an implant or doing a flap or later stages. So all stages of breast reconstruction, even including uh, external breast prosthesis if patients choose not to have reconstruction or lymphedema treatment. 
Um, and uh, bottom line, the, the breast reconstruction surgery after breast cancer should be covered by insurance as it's considered a reconstructive procedure. It's important to note that your coverage may only provide a portion of the total fee. And um, I would recommend calling your insurance company in advance to uh, figure this out. So what does the cost consist of? Well, there's, there's multiple costs. It includes uh, surgeon's fee. Uh, so what the surgeons charges, uh, the uh, bills the insurance company. Um, there's also hospital uh, or surgical facility cost, anesthesia fee, uh, cost of prescription for medications, post-surgical garments, and medical tests and imaging. More importantly than the cost is to find a board-certified plastic surgeon that has experience with breast reconstruction and that you feel comfortable with him or her um, and I, I would argue that's more important than the cost um, because uh, that's your body and the out your outcome um, will depend on, on that connection. So during your consultation, um, your surgeon will ask you or should ask you uh, about your surgical goals. What are you trying to achieve? Uh, they'll ask you about your medical conditions, any drug allergies or medical treatments that you have had. Uh, current medications, supplements, prior surgeries are important to tell your surgeon about. They'll also evaluate general health. Uh, they'll examine your breasts and take measurements of the shape, of their shape, size, and quality of skin. Uh, we do take photographs. It's, a, it's something that is important to document a preoperative appearance of the breasts. Uh, and of course, we'll discuss uh, different treatment options and the course of treatment. And we'll also uh, tackle the, uh, we'll also talk about the outcomes from breast reconstruction surgery and any potential complications that could occur if things don't go uh, perfectly. So what should you ask your surgeon? And that's something that's very important for patients to know. Sometimes they don't know what to ask. So one, uh, you want, when you go to a plastic surgeon for a consultation, you want to ask whether they're board certified by the um, American Board of Plastic Surgery. Um, how many years have they practiced? Uh, do you have privileges at the hospital uh, that, you, uh, that you plan to operate on? Um, am I a good candidate for this procedure? Uh, what will be expected of me to get the best results? Uh, where are you gonna perform the procedure? Are you gonna, is, is the surgeon planning on doing this inpatient, meaning in the hospital or an uh, uh, surgery center uh, and make sure the surgery center is accredited. Uh, what surgical technique will be used? Uh, you know, what type of reconstruction will I have? What are some of the risks? How are the complications handled if they happen? Uh, what are some of my options if I'm not happy with an outcome? And do you have before and after pictures? That's very important to ask. So when it comes to different types of breast reconstruction, uh, this is kind of um, a, uh, I wouldn't say comprehensive uh, list, but it's, it's definitely covers majority of different types of breast reconstruction. So uh, this list includes uh, immediate reconstruction with an implant, immediate breast tissue expander placement, delayed placement of a tissue expander, immediate breast reconstruction with latissimus dorsum muscle, either alone or with a, with a expander or an implant, uh, reconstruction with your own tissue, and finally, oncoplastic reconstruction. So when it comes to implant-based reconstruction, uh, one common way of performing um, or reconstructing the breast is to use an implant. This can be done uh, right after the mastectomy, and um, this can be done with an implant right after the mastectomy, also known as direct-to-implant reconstruction. Uh, this can be placed either under or over the muscle. The implant can be placed either under or over the muscle. And the uh, pros or the advantage of this method is it's one and done. So meaning uh, there's a possibility that just one surgery will recreate uh, the breast and uh, you achieve a normal appearing breast or, or a, at least a a reconstructed breast that you are happy with. 
that sounds good in theory. However, uh, in order for this to happen, you have to have an adequate, uh, need to have an adequate skin envelope, meaning uh, the mastectomy skin uh, that's left behind after um, the breast surgeon is done taking out the breast has to have good blood supply. It also, you have to have enough of that skin in order to fit a large implant under the skin and not cause too much tension and then potential necrosis or skin death. Uh, there's also um, an argument that um, positioning of the implant may not be ideal in the immediate setting as after mastectomy, you have a very large pocket uh, on the ch in the chest that you have to fit that implant in. Thus, a lot of times you have to use uh, alloderm, which essentially is a cellular dermal matrix. It's a, it's a cadaveric dermis that's been processed and decellularized. And that can a lot of times improve the appearance of the implant and um, uh, control for the pocket and improve aesthetics. It's also known that with direct to implant reconstruction, unfortunately, the revisions rate a lot higher just because the implant may not end up um, where it needs to be. And thus you may have to reposition the implant. Um, that's one of the reasons I personally prefer to perform immediate breast reconstruction um, with a tissue expander. So this is a type of reconstruction that's probably most common in the United States. I would say 80% of breast reconstruction um, is likely done in this manner. It's done in two stages. And the advantage of this um, type of uh, reconstruction is that you can really get a control for the pocket or the breast foot plate, meaning where, the, where you want the breast to um, um, be after you're done with the reconstruction. Um, uh, the expander essentially is a spacer that's placed in there, either under the muscle or over the muscle called prepectoral placement and subpectoral placement is under the muscle. And again, in this case, alloderm can also be used. Uh, again, the disadvantage of that method is that you will have to have two surgeries at least. Uh, uh, the first surgery being, you know, placement of tissue expander and the second surgery being uh, taking the tissue expander out and essentially switching to an implant. That's usually done about three to four months after the initial surgery. In the interim, you will need to have expansions. What that means is you will come to the office, plastic surgery office, um, once a week or once every two weeks to fill the expander with saline. This is done percutaneously, meaning through the skin with saline. Um, there's usually a, a port, a metal port in the expander that's incorporated in the expander. It's a one-way valve, meaning uh, when you inject the um, saline, it goes into the expander and stays there. Um, and that's usually what stretches the skin uh, to create a breast mound. So you can see here on the left um, is an example of a tissue expander. This is a one uh, port uh, that can be sometimes have two pores tissue expander. You can see here in the middle, this is the metal piece uh, where uh, we inject the saline to the skin. Uh, this is a sagittal, meaning a cross view of the chest wall with an expander. And you can see a little needle here called the butterfly needle that goes into the port and it fills the expander with saline. And you can see it stretches the skin and the muscle. In this case, this is a subpectoral expander, meaning it's under the muscle and under the skin. And here on the right, you can see the permanent implant that's been replaced. Uh, it's not, uh, uh, it can be a little bit uncomfortable for the patient, but it's usually not painful. Uh, usually in prepectoral reconstruction, meaning if the expander is over the muscle, there's a lot less pain and comfort uh, and more comfort with expansions. Uh, the expander can also be placed in delayed fashion, meaning it can be done after the mastectomy is completed. Sometimes, um, although not ideal, it may be the ideal option for the, this, for the particular patient. It would be a better option to delay reconstruction if the patient has medical 
conditions that would preclude immediate reconstruction and prolonged surgery. So once they're controlled and patients become a better candidate uh, for reconstruction, such in, in the case of poorly controlled diabetes, patient being on corticosteroids, patient be having significant cardiovascular disease or obesity, in those cases, a lot of times it's best to wait and uh, perform breast reconstruction uh, once those issues have been addressed. Um, uh, it, it, the advantage of that method is usually by the time we put tissue expander, the cancer has been fully treated. So you can completely focus on reconstruction and uh, not worry about your cancer. Uh, um, you can argue that aesthetically or cosmetically it would look worse. However, um, I think you can still achieve a very nice result with delayed reconstruction. Uh, you can see here, this is uh, one of my patients who had a right mastectomy uh, for breast cancer and underwent uh, placement of a tissue expander. She then later underwent expander to implant exchange, as you can see in the middle picture, and as well as a breast lift with an implant. And then finally, uh, she underwent nipple areola reconstruction. And this is her final result. She was very pleased with the outcome. This is another patient who had nipple sparing, mastectomy, and uh, had a tissue expander placed, and this is her final result. This is a patient that had skin sparing, mastectomy, and had expanders and nip, uh, then implant placed um, with nipple, re nipple areola reconstruction. This is uh, another patient of mine uh, that had uh, left-sided breast cancer and underwent um, uh, skin sparing mastectomy and had radiation and then underwent um, implant placement. Now, I will say that in the setting of radiation, uh, the complication rate um, definitely increases. I quote up to 50% complication rate with uh, mastectomy reconstruction using implants in the setting of radiation. We generally still put the place the expanders at the time of mastectomy. And then after patients complete radiation, we'll wait about six months to exchange the expander for a permanent implant. Unfortunately, a lot of times the reconstruction is affected and the breast has been radiated, even if it doesn't get infected, um, still uh, looks contracted and somewhat asymmetric. However, you can still achieve a reasonable result even after radiation. Using the latissimus muscle for breast reconstruction uh, is not my first go-to option. Generally, it's uh, an option for patients that have failed breast reconstruction, either, either due to infection, extrusion, uh, or just uh, poor aesthetic outcome. Uh, latissimus muscle is a big muscle in your back that's essentially um, uh, br brought over to your chest to cover the expander or the implant, and it serves to resurface uh, the um, mastectomy uh, wound and essentially uh, improve the aesthetic uh, result. Uh, it can be, it works well in the setting of radiation. So patients that had radiation and failed their uh, expanders or implants, a lot of times uh, will benefit from a latissimus dorsi reconstruction as it can resurface the uh, damaged radiated skin. Uh, it can be used with or without an implant. However, it's more common to use it with an implant as latissimus alone will not usually um, achieve enough projection of volume um, without an implant. It's a moderate surgery. It takes about two hours and you stay in the hospital about one night and uh, recovery is roughly about three to four weeks. This is an example of latissimus dorsi reconstruction. As you can see here, the muscle and the skin paddle is taking, taken from the back. You end up with a small incision kind of placed in the, um, uh, the back here. It's a 
horizontal uh, incision, usually hidden in the bra strap. And then the muscle is kind of tunneled underneath the skin and brought over to the chest to resurface the um, skin here and the implant or expander is placed underneath. Autologous reconstruction is um, uh, one of my ex specialties or expertise. Um, it's a natural way to perform breast reconstruction. You replace like with like, uh, meaning uh, when you transfer tissue to reconstruct the breast, it's mostly fat that's transferred. And as we know, especially as women age, uh, the majority of their breast is made of fat. Um, so this type of reconstruction, unlike implant-based reconstruction, has good longevity, meaning uh, where implants usually look worse with time. Uh, the autologous reconstruction or your own tissues usually look better with time as they incorporate and really resurface the breast. They usually tolerate radiation therapy well, although we generally prefer to do autologous reconstruction after or six months after radiation therapy is completed. And it's very safe uh, in radiated wounds. Um, although the complication rate is slightly higher, but usually the tissue does well. Um, it can also be used uh, during uh, failed implant reconstructions, or if there's insufficient tissue on the chest wall to place an implant or expander. Some patients uh, personally, they have personal reasons uh, to avoid uh, implants. They do not want implants and uh, they have the body type um, or enough sufficient tissue in their abdomen or their thighs uh, to uh, perform autologous reconstruction. Uh, generally, some, patient, some patients may be a poor candidate for this type of reconstruction, specifically for abdominal base flaps. If there's not enough tissue in the lower abdomen, there's prior abdominal surgery, such as a tummy tuck has been done. They maybe had prior flap, like a DIP or a tram flap. They have severe coagulopathy, meaning they have a clotting disorder, or they have um, uh, severe abdominal hernias or poor health. Uh, some of the examples of autologous reconstruction include um, a pedicle tram flap, free tram flap, and muscle sparing tram DIP flap. Those are just kind of like a spectrum of different types of abdominally based flaps, where essentially we do almost like a tummy tuck uh, incision and take that tissue and instead of throwing it away, we can use it for, um, to create a breast. Uh, the, it's not exactly a tummy tuck as the scar is higher usually than it would be in a tummy tuck. However, there's a lot of similarities. Um, uh, there is some abdominal morbidity as the, a little bit of muscle sometimes is harvested or fascia is inside. Thus, there can be a, a small risk of hernia or bulge formation about four to 8%. This is an example of a DIP flap uh, where you can see here a uh, ellipse of skin and fat is taken from the lower abdomen uh, and transferred uh, to the chest. This is a one of my patient who had, uh, I believe BRCA gene. You can see here on the left prior to reconstruction, she had a prior uh, breast uh, reduction and this is her about three months after uh, DIA, bilateral DIP reconstruction. She was uh, fairly happy with her outcome. Uh, thigh base flaps is another way to reconstruct the breasts. Uh, the, these type of fl uh, flaps are best for women with small to medium sized breasts. And to achieve uh, larger uh, breasts, these flaps may be combined uh, what's called the stacked flaps, meaning there's two flaps, two thigh flaps are used for one breast. That's where we'll make incisions in the inner thighs and take skin and fat, almost like a, a thigh lift approach and transfer that tissue to the breast. Some of the names you may hear uh, that describe these type of flaps are called uh, are tug, vog, dog, pap, uh, and stacked flaps. Um, some of the, some women may not be candidates for these type of flaps if they don't have enough tissue in their inner thighs. They have maybe prior scars in the thighs that could preclude these type of reconstructions and some of the vessels may be damaged. They may have lymphedema or swelling of the lower extremity. Uh, they can be poor microsurgical candidates or had previous flaps that failed and are seeking an alternatives. This is a, one of my um, patients that actually 
um, had um, uh, left breast reconstruction in the past with a DIP flap. You can see the abdominal scar here. This was done, I believe, in Johns Hopkins. She came to me with a new diagnosed tumor in the right breast, and she wanted purely autologous reconstruction. In this case, I had to take a flap from each inner thigh um, and reconstruct her right breast. And we also performed nipple areola reconstruction on the right. And this is her three months post-op. She was uh, happy with her outcome. Final oncom plastic surgery, Dr. Lisa Spiegel talked about it in her talk and did a very nice job. I'll just briefly go over that as well. Um, we usually use different breast reduction mastopexy techniques to uh, rearrange the breast tissue after partial mastectomy or lumpectomy. There's volume displacement and volume replacement techniques. What that means is with volume displacement, we use your breast tissue to rearrange and then create a breast that looks and feels natural uh, that you're happy with. And a lot of times we'll also address your normal breast to um, match the reconstructed breast. Volume displacement techniques or volume replacement, I'm sorry, volume replacement techniques is where we have to take a small area of tissue either from the back or sometimes the lateral chest wall and transfer uh, into the mastectomy, um, into the partial lumpectomy defect, partial mastectomy defect, and that's to fill in the, the volume lost. Uh, and that's generally applicable to women that don't have large enough breasts to perform a reduction or a lift. It's a very versatile way uh, to uh, reconstruct a breast. I, I, would, I feel like it's an ideal option for women that are candidates for breast conservation therapy a surgery. Uh, it tolerates radiation well, um, and it can prevent lumpectomy, uh, deformity, and has a high satisfaction rate. This is an example of a, a patient of mine that had central lumpectomy and underwent oncoplastic reconstruction with immediate nipple areola reconstruction, and she was fairly happy with the, her final outcome. Nipple reconstruction is also important. Um, I feel like this is the last stage of reconstruction. I generally, generally done at the third stage of reconstruction after everything has been done. Uh, there are many ways to reconstruct a nipple. We generally use patients on skin to create a nipple, as you can see here in the, in the diagram. And then eventually the areola gets reconstructed either with a skin graft or a tattoo, as you can see here, it can be a two dimensional tattoo. There are also options for three dimensional tattoos if nipple reconstruction is not an option. Finally, you can also take tissue from the gluteal area. That's the uh, fat is usually removed from the upper lower buttock. Uh, generally, it's not very common in my practice. I consider it a tertiary option if patient is not a candidate for abdominally based or thigh based autologous reconstruction. And the reason being is because it's harder to mold that fat and also sometimes it flattens the buttock and requires secondary surgery to correct the deformity, usually with fat grafting, and it's a longer and more difficult surgery. However, there are some candidates for this type of reconstruction if nothing else is available. And this is an example where the, the skin is taking it as an ellipse here, it's taking from the upper buttock area. Uh, usually requires position change uh, when a patient starts in supine position, then they're prone, then they're supine again. And so it's a, it's a longer surgery. Some of the risks involved are the same risk as with any other surgery. They include bleeding, infection, poor healing, and anesthesia re risk. There's always a risk of loss of the flap, which can be the partial or complete. Um, luckily, in my practice, it's not very common, and um, it's about 1% to 2%. Um, there is a lot of times loss of sensation in both the donor and reconstruction side. Um, with implants, you know, there's always a risk of capsule contraction and implant rupture. However, generally, it doesn't happen very often. Um, and it's important to note, and I still see this every week in my clinic, patients coming in and, and are scared of silicone implants, that it's important to know that breast implants do not impair breast health or general health in general. Uh, there's been a lot of scientific research conducted that has no proven link between breast implants and autoimmune or other systemic diseases. Um, so some final thoughts, um, I would say the, the final results of breast reconstruction and full mastectomy can help lessen physical and emotional impact of mastectomy. Over time, some breast skin sensation may return and scar lines will improve, although they'll never completely disappear. There are trade-offs, but most women feel 
These are small compared to the large improvement in the quality of life and ability to look and feel whole. Careful monitoring of breast health through self-exam and other diagnostic techniques is essential to your long-term health. Thank you very much. And again, I, I appreciate, it's an honor. I appreciate the, the opportunity to talk. It's an honor to be here. I'll take any questions if needed. These are my references. Okay, thank you for that. I'm gonna go ahead and ask you to close your, minimize your presentation. Um, and then we'll get um, Dr. Spiegel back up here as well. We have, um, perfect. Um, so we have several questions that have come in um, and I'm gonna go ahead and ask those. And Dr. Spiegel, whenever you get a second, go ahead and unmute yourself and um, share your uh, video as well. Our first question Marcia, that we have. Uh, sorry to interrupt. I think you need to start my video for me. Okay, we'll take care of that for you. Thank you. <laughs> I can try now. There we go. Okay, they're perfect. Okay. Um, so our first question is, are there any um, alternative treatments to cure cancer? Mm, that's a loaded question. So when you look at evidence-based data, um, right now, I assume it's looking more at holistic approach to breast cancer treatment, but there's no data looking at whether there's natural compounds or um, natural remedies such as um, turmeric or whatnot that has been shown to cure breast cancer the way that we have medicines to cure breast cancer. Um, so typically what I recommend in my patients is that um, to take a holistic approach in terms of integrating both at this point. Um, will something happen down the line? Will we learn more that we can, um, you know, integrate or use for treatment of breast cancer? But at this time, um, the medicines such as anti-estrogen uh, therapies, chemotherapy, targeted anti-HER2 therapy is really critical in certain patients in curing breast cancer and um, doing the alternative or holistic approach to therapy has not been shown to be um, successful. Okay. okay, thank you for that answer. Hey, can, um, I add, can I include one other thing? Please, yes. Um, and this is not just looking at uh, alternative um, compounds to take, but we do think highly of integrating um, other therapies into our breast cancer treatment patients or breast cancer treatments for our patients. <clears throat> and those really are using our integrative medicine program. And so we have specialists here that will um, integrate acupuncture, uh, yoga. Uh, we have nutritionists available at UF Health um, to help with diet. Uh, our physical therapists are very involved in not only lymphedema, but also learning about body composition. And so we really look at the whole person or patient um, and try to have options or integrate other um, means of therapy. Uh, but in terms of specific to other cures for cancer, we don't um, have anything available at this time. Okay, thank you. Um, what factors determine removal of lymph nodes at the time of a mastectomy? So lymph node staging is, is very important uh, in terms of figuring out whether cancer has left the breast, okay? Again, it's part of that staging system to see whether uh, cancer has not only been within the breast, but it has escaped into the lymphatic system, into the lymph nodes. Um, there's a lot of factors that are involved in determining when we include lymph node surgery, but pretty standard of care is using lymph node staging, and, and we didn't go into this because we were focusing mainly on the breast tissue, but lymph node staging is a procedure called sentinel lymph node biopsy if women don't have clinically involved lymph nodes with cancer. And we use that procedure in patients that have invasive breast cancer. 
Um, the lymphatics of the breasts reside around or live around those ducts and live around those lobules. So patients with in situ or stage zero cancers like a ductal carcinoma in situ, um, those tumor cells are within the ducts and haven't broken through the duct wall. And so those patients should not have disease within the lymph nodes. So if it's an invasive cancer, then we include lymph node surgery. Specifically for mastectomy though, um, there are and there is standard uh, practice to take lymph nodes in patients with that in situ cancer during a mastectomy. And the reason being is because we don't have all the tissue out. And so if there's a little invasive cancer hiding within that DCIS or in that in situ cancer, we can't go back and another operation to sample the lymph nodes. And at that point, we have to talk about a big decision of taking all the lymph nodes out, which places women at very high risk of lymphedema. So and when women save their breast or remove their breast for invasive cancer, we sample the lymph nodes. When we remove the breast for in situ cancer, we, we sample the lymph nodes. So it's a, it's a little complicated and a little personalized to each patient. But I do have to say, um, I have a strong passion for lymphedema. We have a lymphedema surveillance program here at UF. We started it in 2014. We do lymph preventative lymphatic surgery here. And another um, way to find the sentinel nodes or what we call map or lymphatic mapping of the sentinel nodes is by using dye injection in the breast to find those lymph nodes. That dye travels through the lymphatic channels to get to the little lymph nodes under the arm. And we are now recently trialing a new lymphatic mapping agent. It's an iron product that will stay within those lymph nodes for at least three weeks, if not more. And so women that have a mastectomy for in situ cancer don't have to have necessarily those lymph nodes removed at the initial operation anymore. And so this is something new and exciting and something that we have just gotten approval uh, for our patients. And again, going along with my passion for preventing lymphedema allows me to do a mastectomy for DCIS patients that need it without removing any lymph node tissue. Okay, thank you. That's That sounds like some exciting progress there. Um, will living a healthy lifestyle cut our chances of having breast cancer? The answer to that is yes. Um, the biggest one, and what I recommend for my patients that see me, whether they see me for high risk or risk assessment or breast cancer, is leading an active life, um, eating healthy, keeping your body weight down. That's the big thing. The same diet exercise that you would use to protect your heart is the same thing as it is to protect your breast. So keeping that body weight down, being active, eating healthy um, protects you against developing breast cancer. But breast cancer is multifactorial. It is not just one thing that's going to prevent you from breast cancer. It's important to do everything. And so eating healthy, exercising, minimizing alcohol, avoiding hormone replacement therapy, especially the combined estrogen and progesterones um, in patients that are high risk, unless it affects the quality of life. All of those things a woman can do to help prevent breast cancer in their life. Okay, some good recommendations there. Um, can you discuss the different types of implants for mastectomy patients and how do you determine which type is best for which patient? What are the considerations for that? It's a very good question. Thank you for asking. Um, so. There are multiple types of implants that we use for breast reconstruction. Those include um, saline implants, and uh, they also include silicone implants, which can be either round or shaped. Uh, it also more, it's also more complicated because the implants can be either textured or they can be smooth. Um, a lot of it depends on personal preference. However, in my hands, I typically use round, smooth um, silicone implants. 
And the reason I use those is because I feel like number one, uh, silicone implants feel more natural than saline implants and they have better projection and uh, natural feel. There's less rippling and, and I feel like they last longer and, and give a longer, more satisfactory results. I also don't like to use textured implants. And the reason being, uh, number one, if uh, most textured implants are anatomic, meaning they're not spherical or round. Um, and so they're, they're shaped. And so if they flip or your, your pocket that you place in is not perfect, it distorts the breast. The other reason uh, we recently started using them less and less is because of risk of breast implant associated anaplastic large cell lymphoma or known as BIAALCL. That's a very rare disease, very rare uh, cancer that's uh, been associated uh, with uh, textured, primarily with textured breast implants. So far there's been about 370 cases in the world diagnosed. And I think the first case appeared sometime in early 2000s and we're still seeing cases. Again, it's very rare and it's usually uh, treatable um, uh, with uh, surgery if detected early and uh, doesn't have a high mortality. However, I would not want to put patients at risk for this type of uh, uh, disease, even if it's small using textured implants. So I generally use implants again, in summary that are round, that have high, that are high profile, meaning they give patients better projection as the patients have lost a lot of uh, volume and they lost their breast. And so you need them to give more projection uh, in my mastectomy patients. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I think, I think it answered the question very well. Thank you. Thank you for the answer. Um, what do you do differently for male breast cancer? Maybe from a surgical perspective um, or you know, from a plastics perspective as well? So the incidence of breast cancer in men, or if you look at all breast cancers diagnosed, only 1% of breast cancer occurs in men. So it is very rare. Um, we do have a little higher suspicion in men that they could have a genetic link to breast cancer. So all men that come to see me with a diagnosis of, diagnosis of breast cancer, we send for genetic testing. We don't do anything differently um, in terms of genetic testing for the male with breast cancer, unlike what we do with a female with a genetic link. Um, in terms of taking or doing risk reducing surgery for the contralateral breast or the unaffected breast. When we look at statistics, um, if, we, if men have a genetic link to breast cancer, um, they still have a very low risk of getting cancer in the other breast. And so we leave that breast alone. In women, if they have a genetic link to breast cancer, their risk is, of getting cancer in the unaffected breast is on average about 3% per year. So in 10 years, that woman has a risk of about 30% to get cancer in the unaffected breast. And so we talk a lot about doing not only mastectomy for the cancer treatment in women, but doing preventative surgery for the other side. So they would have a bilateral mastectomy. And we don't really do that as much for men. When we talk about what are the options for men, we mimic what we do with women, okay? So if we can save the breast, we can save the breast. We can do a lumpectomy, we can add radiation, we can sample the nodes, do a sentinel node biopsy, and if we need to, we need to remove the rest of the nodes, which is called an axillary dissection. Unfortunately, um, men get, their cancers get found later, at a later stage, because they are not screened with mammography. And we don't screen BRCA male carriers with mammography because again, the incidence of breast cancer is so low. So um, in that situation, many times that men that come to see me, um, they typically get their cancers in the central breast. So in the um, right behind the nipple. Uh, and many times they come to me already with lymph nodes involved. So their cancers sometimes are a little bit more um, advanced at presentation and therefore require a little bit more advanced surgery in terms of what to do with the breast 
and what to do, the lymph nodes. 90% um, of male breast cancers are hormonally driven. They are ER positive, what we call estrogen receptor positive, or they have expressed estrogen receptors. And so men get treated just like women with anti-estrogen pills. We give them tamoxifen to reduce metastatic spread and to reduce recurrence. So male breast cancer treatment mimics what we do in many ways, what we do with women, but they typically present later and we send them for genetics, but we don't strongly support or encourage removing the unaffected breasts for reduction in future risk of breast cancer because that risk is, is fairly low. Okay, thank you for that, that information. Um, someone asks, they said, I had polycystic breast and several annoying ultrasound-guided ultrasound cyst aspirations. Years later, I had bilateral implants, silicone in 2005. I've never had the painful cysts anymore. Are my silicone implants dangerous to keep for a long time? Um. So the, sh the short answer is no. However, um, uh, they, what you have to understand about uh, your implants is that they're not a permanent device. So what that means every year, uh, the shell of the implant gets weaker. Um, and um, at about 10 years, um, the, the general data suggests that there's about a 20% risk of uh, implant rupture which is not inherently dangerous. However, it can lead to capsular contracture and breast deformity. Um, also with time, uh, the uh, capsule around the implant usually gets, capsule is the scar tissue around the implant gets harder and the, it becomes more contracted and can distort the shape of the breast. It can also cause uh, distortion and pain. Um, there's different classification for capsular contracture from one to four, uh, one being the normal soft capsule, normal soft implant, with four being a severe um, capsule that a lot of times results in breast distortion and pain. So if you had implants for a long time, but the implants feel soft, you're still happy with their shape and size, uh, you're happy with their position, they don't cause you discomfort, there is really nothing much to worry about. Uh, currently, FDA does recommend getting an MRI five years after the initial breast augmentation or reconstruction if you have silicone implants, and then two or three years thereafter. However, that's not a strict recommendation. I don't necessarily enforce them as they can be cost associated with that, especially for breast augmentation. If you do have a ruptured implant detected on mammogram or MRI that you had for some reason, it's important to see a plastic surgeon for consultation. We may or may not recommend removing the implant based on um, your symptoms and um, how your breasts look and feel. But um, again, it's not dangerous to have silicone implants for a long time. And even if they're ruptured, there's no immediate danger to your health um, or well-being. Okay, we have another great question. What medical reason other than cancer could make a mastectomy or an implant insertion be covered by insurance? Yes, um, there are other reasons and I have, um, and I have seen patients with, um, uh, for breast reconstruction um, that did not have breast cancer. Uh, that could be, uh, well, number one is if they have a genetic predisposition to breast cancer and are looking for prophylactic mastectomy, an example would be BRCA1 or 2 positive patients. The other reasons are traumatic reasons where a patient uh, uh, were involved, say, in a car accident and had significant uh, soft tissue injury to their breasts. Um, some other reasons can include infections. I had a patient that had um, severe infection of the nipple and lost her nipple, unfortunately. So I performed, uh, you know, nipple reconstruction and scar revision for her. Um, can some of the congenital defects, an example would be Poland syndrome, 
uh, which is a um, type of syndrome that affects development of your chest wall. A lot of times it uh, affects development of your pectoralis uh, muscle, uh, ribs, and um, a lot of times breast. And uh, some of the genetic or congenital disorders can affect um, development of the breast and will be covered by insurance for breast reconstruction. Generally, if you had cosmetic breast surgery, such as a lift uh, uh, or uh, augmentation in the past, and you have a problem 10, 20 years later, such as capsular contracture or rupture, generally insurance likely will not cover that procedure, even if you're having symptoms because your implants were placed for cosmetic reasons. Sometimes they can cover a procedure called capsulectomy or implant removal and remove the capsule, but generally they will not cover our, um, new implants uh, or um, some other fees. Okay, thank you. Uh, another question, this is a pretty specific one. Would you consider giving a metastatic breast cancer patient who is currently under palliative chemotherapy an additional CDK4 slash six inhibitor to benefit from the potential myeloprotective effect and thus potentially increase dosage or duration of chemotherapy? The patient's already received Palob Plus, Fluorescent, and... Marsha, I'm going to stop yes. you now because I do think that that's probably best for a medical oncologist to answer. Uh -huh. It's a pretty specific question and unrelated to surgery. So. Okay. Good. I wasn't, I was too sure about that one. So I thought, but, well, but, I but we, I'm it. happy if you want to take that um, participant's yeah. name and we can get them um, teed into a even a telemedicine visit with one of our medical oncologists or get them yeah. So the person asked that I'll reach out to them directly and um, connect to how to get that answer in, in a little bit better format. So perfect. Um, and then I think we have time for one more question. Um, do treatment plans change when a patient has had a relapse of breast cancer? Yes. Um, so Again, everybody's treatment plans in their initial diagnosis of breast cancer varies. So the decision making will really be based on what therapies they received up front. Did they save their breasts? Did they have radiation treatment? Did they have a mastectomy? Um, did they not have radiation? What happened with the lymph nodes? So it depends on what the stage is of that initial breast cancer. Was it DCIS or stage zero? Was it an invasive breast cancer? The big, I guess, take home points on that question would be that if a woman has saved their breasts, they've had radiation, we really try not to re-radiate the breast, okay? Um, which means that a woman who has a recurrence in a breast that has had breast conservation or radiation, the standard approach would be mastectomy in that situation. Um, and I'll let Dr. Langold comment on the fact that um, previously radiated tissue sometimes is more difficult to reconstruct um, in a second. If um, a woman has had a mastectomy with a chest wall recurrence, then the treatment for, and not ever had radiation before, then the treatment for that would be excision of the recurrence in the skin, that typically that occurs on the skin. Sometimes it can occur deep into the muscle, but most of the time it occurs on the skin. And so we resect the skin or the location uh, with negative margins. Um, and then typically if they haven't had re radiation, we do radiate those patients as well. So the answer to that question really would depend on what that individual um, presented with, with the first cancer and what the treatment strategy or plan was at that time. And then we base their treatment plan based on that but I'll let Dr. Lango talk a little bit about um, reconstruction in a radiated breast. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Lisa. Um, so I think reconstruction in a radiated breast is a challenge for a novice or an experienced plastic surgeon. Um, a lot of times uh, what happens after radiation, uh, the breast, um, the, the chest skin becomes very fibrotic and, um, and, and hard and, and uh, a really hostile environment 
um, for reconstruction. There's uh, poor um, blood flow to the skin. Uh, a lot of times the wounds don't heal very well in irradiated uh, skin. However, there are options for patients that had radiation. Uh, in general, we avoid using implants or expanders alone uh, in this setting. And I try to um, push those patients towards autologous reconstruction. So that usually involves reconstruction with their abdominal tissue, uh, thigh tissue, gluteal tissue, or um, using a back muscle called latissimus dorsi muscle, which we can use with an implant. Um, so uh, bottom line, uh, when, you, when we see those patients, we don't recommend um, just using implants as, as likely they will get infected, uh, fail, and result in poor um, aesthetic outcome.